Hi, Tommy. Hello, Terry. How are you doing? Good. It's a real honor to have you on my show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Where were you born? And I know you grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, but talk about you know, your beginnings when you started. I'm a Kentuckian. You already know John Carpenter is also from the same hometown. I was born in a little bitty town and we moved around a couple of times. So I didn't land in Bowling Green until I was about four or five years old. There on out until college, it was Bowling Green, Kentucky, home of Western Kentucky University. My existence was a typical small town. I had a male parent, female parent, and a sister. So, you know, just basically you're a corny old standard story of the USA. My chief interests early on, art and Boy Scout, lots and lots of sports. That was little town life. You could bicycle all the way downtown, past the college, run in packs, you know, after school. Parents didn't worry about where you were as long as you showed up for dinner. <laughs> uh, that kind of a bucolic existence, uh, at least on my side of town. Years go by and I become increasingly aware of inequality in this country and how good I had it as a young white person. I feel it necessary to at least tip my hat to the struggles that our brothers and sisters are having if they're if they're not our color. How would you describe yourself in school? Because one of the things I think is important, you know, I'm 57, so I think it's important that kids don't have to be the biggest jock. They don't have to be the most popular kid in school. They don't even have to be the biggest ladies' man to make something of their lives. How would you describe what you were like in that school time? Right in the middle, pretty much average all the way through. I Maybe a little bit better than average student. I didn't study much. I just got by on kind of faking it. I loved literature. I read all the time. Loved music. I was playing piano before I knew that I had was taking piano lessons. In our little school, which was a college teacher's training school on the campus of the university, it was such a tiny place that you were being recruited into the orchestra by the time you were in the fourth grade. I was sort of dead, just appointed a trombone player, so I learned how to play that instrument without any real passion for it. My passion was to be rock and roll. My sister is five years older, so I got in on birth in a commercial sense, in a U.S. kind of sense. I got in on the birth of rock and roll, thanks to her. Just why about it, glued to the radio all the time. When did you meet John Carpenter? What age, what age or what part of school did you guys meet? It, it's impossible to say. John was one year older and therefore that's a huge gap when you're in when you're a kid. So he was one of those big kids. We passed each other in the hallways countless times. Certainly by fourth grade, he was also in the orchestra. So we were starting to know of each other and become familiar with each other, at least knowing each other's name and stuff. But our friendship really didn't gel until we were teenagers. I suppose it must have been about 63 or 64. It was certainly after the Beatles and the rest of the British invasion hit. Everybody I knew was picking up a guitar, learning how to play and starting to let their hair grow long. One of these orchestra trips we took to play our music at other schools and other places, I noticed in the back of the bus, there was John with a guitar. All these girls gathered around him. Thought, hey, this looks like a winning combination. Let's see what he's doing. So I went and I'd been in church choirs ever since I could remember. So I knew a thing or two about harmony. So whatever he was singing, I just chimed in on and a friendship was born. At, at that point in school, did you guys start to think about filmmaking? I mean, I know you probably weren't making movies, but were you what? Did you ever talk about movies or see a movie in the drive-in or the local theater? There were three movie houses in Bowling Green and two drive-in theaters. So there was ample access to whatever was out there. My friends, I was wild about horror movies, science fiction, especially, you know, flying saucer kind of movies and westerns naturally you know you'd bump into your friends down at the state theater or the capitol theater on the square or a little bit later at the drive-in movies between john and me i didn't really have any concept at all well how how movies got made john was way ahead in that category by the time he was nine or ten years old he was starting to shape his own ambition to become a movie director well i didn't even know what the hell a movie director was or what <laughs> he did. as our friendship gelled into a musical relationship. You know, we sang together quite a bit and John was starting to write his own song, which knocked me over. John was a creative dynamo. He was drawing comic books and writing articles for some wrestling magazine. He was not mad about wrestling. He had written a novel. I never saw his novel, but he, I mean, we're talking about a kid. He was a writer. He would sit down. His parents had a uh, an office with a typewriter stand and a typewriter and a big stack of paper next to it. 
And so he would roll in there and type away. So all of this had a big, big impression on me. I started to see the possibilities of a creative life not just some kind of hobby, but something where you really pursued creative activity, made up stories or songs. Or And I know that by that point, John had been making movies of his own. He showed me a couple of his eight millimeter efforts, you know, just fun projects as an excuse. It's kind of pretend projects like monster kind of movies with, you know, model airplanes taking off to shoot at the monster. And <laughs> here's the carpet and here's the model airplane and here's the thread pulling the model airplane out of the shop. It was, he was teaching himself how to make movies, literally. It was also, of course, rock and roll was everything. And so I, I remember him grabbing his camera, having me strap on a guitar and sort of doing what turned out to be like music video kind of behaviors, you know. You're you're holding the, the thing and I'll, I'll put the guitar right up against the lens of the camera and you know, stuff, just silly stuff like that. But his enthusiasm for the image and making movies was rubbing off on me because I had a great interest in art and I had perhaps a little talent at it. My interest in that direction kept being thwarted by orchestra was scheduled at the same time in school. It wasn't like this vast universe of classes you could take. There was art and there was orchestra and there was drama <laughs> and all three occurred at the same time. So you had to do. And my father, who was very liberal minded and very lenient about everything, for some reason was really insistent on me sticking with orchestra on an instrument I didn't care anything about. Acceded to his wishes right up until my senior year when I put my foot down and said, I'm taking art. I'm not doing stupid orchestra anymore. So so, and that art class changed everything for me. It's just a great art teacher who was conscious of graphic design and really just guided me toward a, an area I had tremendous passion for, which was visual design and graphic design. So when I graduated, I started looking around for an opportunity to educate myself in that area. I found my way to uh, Ohio University. Now, at that point, John had already went to California, right? He did, uh, let's see, he's one year older. He did two years at Western. I did one year at Western. Then we both split. He went West and I went North. Now, were you aware that he went West? Oh, yeah. 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 Partly responsible because he was he was definitely going to leave town and go somewhere. And I knew about, about this book they had at the library, the university. So I took him there and showed him this giant blue book of college. He leafed through it. I think he arrived at three finalists in his mind, New York University, University of Miami and Florida, USC Cinema. Those were his choices. And through whatever process happened after that, I don't know, but I know I helped guide him to those three. After you went to Ohio, what made you decide to go west to California? I was successful as a graphic design student, developed a really fun portfolio. And it was a good time to be a graphic designer. We're talking about late 60s, right at the end of the 60s. Graphic design was just exploding in all directions. And you could tell by the album covers and the posters, rock and roll posters. Most of this stuff was coming out of New York. Found out that uh, there was a studio there called Pushpin. A couple of fantastic mentor type. They weren't my personal mentors, but I considered them that way. Uh, Milton Glaser and Seymour Quast, these are giants in graphic design and illustration. One of my notions was to go to New York, show them my portfolio, and I would, naturally I'd be successful and they would take me in and I would be a great designer. At the same time as that ambition was developing in my mind, John and I were continuing to correspond. Back then it was snail mail, strictly. There wasn't any such thing as computers and email and all the rest. And the letters he would write, I went out to Sunset Strip the other night. The doors were playing at the Whiskey. There were all these people on the streets and they were they were trying to sell me acid, grass, and all these cops were around, all these incredibly beautiful women right by the Buffalo Springfield. And it's like, what? This, he, <laughs> he really uh, made it sound like paradise. And so I went to visit him. Christmas must have been 1968, going to 69 or 69 going to 70, something like that. It so happened I, I hit very new year. If you know California, if you know Los Angeles in December and January, it's gorgeous there. There's no smog. The hills and the palm trees are waving and the weather's nice. And so I naively thought this is what it is all year round. <laughs> 
<laughs> that helped seal the deal. And back then, it wasn't nearly as challenging to get into a school. You know, people now, Jesus, they plan these things two, three years in advance, and they've got to write all these applications and send all this money to different schools. And so for me, it was just like, okay, I'm graduating in the summer in June. And here it is spring break. So I got a couple of friends and we borrowed a car through my portfolio in the trunk. We went off to California from Ohio. All these plans to, you know, okay, let's see, we've got uh, eight days or nine days or something like that. So let's go to the Grand Canyon and we're going to go to oh, Yellowstone. <laughs> and we've got to go, we'll go by San Francisco and with a blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, just getting to Los Angeles <laughs> and doing the thing I went to do, which was to apply for graduate school at USC Cinema, that took up all the time. So forget about Yellowstone or anything. <laughs> I walked in, the animation teacher at USC liked my portfolio. So I was in. It was about that simple. Going back to still in Ohio for just a moment, was that around the same time? And was it far off from Kent State? Like all that stuff <laughs> going on? It was right. It was right down the road from Kent State, you could say, in every way. My sophomore year, my first year at Ohio was my sophomore year in college. It was just typical. It was long-haired hippies, people hanging out, learning about, gee, what's this stuff? Oh, it's it's pot, man. Don't you have you never smoked? Oh, really? Here, listen and listen to this new album. It's from some group called Led Zeppelin. Put on the earphone. That was the first year I was there. But by the second year, it was tear gas. It was demonstrating in the streets. A National Guard lined up down the main streets of our town, like oh every other town in Ohio. Nixon was bombing Cambodia. It was a serious protest. The, my junior year, we closed school. It was like six weeks early or something like the riots got so bad. That got involved with draft. The draft really was what fueled the protest move. <laughs> Somebody in a position of authority hadn't figured out that, hey, if you're going to take people against their will and make them pick up a weapon, pledge to kill people, in effect, it's not going to go over very well, uh, especially as you get up the food chain into more privileged families, you're going to get a lot of pushback. That's what happened, of course. That's a, a encapsulation of the 60s in, in one fell swoop. Everybody was worried about the same thing. He had a student deferment. No, you're not 1A until suddenly you are. And then, uh-oh, I have to decide, am I going to go fake some kind of way of getting out of it? Am I going to run for Canada? Am I going to go to jail and be, or am I going to be a conscientious? There are all these stupid, horrible choices, if you will, facing all of us males at that point with no good option, unless you really were somebody who just loved to learn how to uh, shoot and kill. It, it wasn't a good thing. I was relieved of need to choose thanks to the call, the lottery, you drew a number uh, or somebody drew a number representing your birth date. And I just happened to draw a high number. So I didn't have to worry about it anymore. And other people had to go or had to run to Canada. That was the backdrop for all that. So when you got to USC, did you have certain expectations of how you thought it was going to be based on what you saw on your trip and what John was saying? And how close did it end up being what you envisioned, how much different was it when you actually got to do it? I had a pretty decent picture, thanks to John and thanks to my own visit, of what it was going to be like. The cinema department at that point was situated in an old, I believe it was a stable, had once been a stable. It was very funky, built around a little courtyard. Couldn't have been a better place. Camaraderie and, and encouraging interaction among people. The cinema program was ingeniously designed. You started out in an eight millimeter course, making your own little movies for a semester. And then you graduated to a three man crew situation using black and white film, uh, 16 millimeter film, non-sync sound for your second set of three projects. You rotated being the cinematographer, being the writer, director, and being the editor. So you learned some skills over the course of the semester. Genius, really brilliant. Then uh, if you went on from there, you went into more ambitious uh, 16 millimeter color sync sound project, 15, 20, 30 minutes long, more ambitious student films with a five-man crew, uh, which I never did finish my uh, master's degree there because I, I made a movie, like so many others, really ambitious, had no money, but you learn how to invent things and to, how to be creative. Starman in November was my what you would call a thesis film. And I worked on that thing for, it, this is a semester course, but I worked on it for more than a year. Got incompletes and all the 
other courses I was supposed to be taking. And so that, <laughs> that's a fairly typical story at film school is you wind up becoming obsessed with your film and not with necessarily every course that you were supposed to write a paper for. Now, how many of the other students around you at that time made something within the industry? There's a not, there's an unending roster of you can look at the names it just goes on and on by the time i was in there everybody was talking about george lucas because oh, he, he had been in school just a few years before he had made some really amazing student films one of which uh, thx 1138 was his first feature everybody was a buzz about george my classmate one of my classmates was bob zemeckis oh geez he, <laughs> he turned out to make a name for himself didn't he <laughs> while i was still a ta for uh, one of the one of the faculty members there one kid in our class was ronnie howard oh my god <laughs> he, he was coming through and so nobody knew i just named the tip of the iceberg there are so many luminaries all along the way it's a, it's a feeder school i mean it really is geared toward sending people i mean it's in the right town it's got its attitude unlike ucla which was a different setup altogether and more oriented perhaps in a healthy way more oriented toward creativity and encouraging artistry and all that. At USC was more like a trade school. You, you learned the, just the bones of it all. You learned sound, you learned sound theory, all about the camera, all about light. And you were put through processes that kind of prepared you for, okay, what's your story about? Pitch this story in an elevator? Yep. <laughs> or <laughs> what, can you tell me my the story that you want me to give you money for? All those things were kind of built into the curriculum in a way that helped get you ready to go up the street to join the the industry was was the attitude a camaraderie where everyone was working together or did it pit each other against each other so there was like competition and one was trying to one up the other or were you guys working in unison because i <laughs> i know i know when you're when you're a younger person i know because i was like this myself even in high school you get that kind of competitiveness with your friends I, yeah as you get older i find that that's actually not smart you guys should work everybody should work together what was it like at that time were you guys helping one another or were you kind of trying to do your own thing? It's a good question. I think it is totally reflective of the personalities of the people involved. I was totally hippied out. And so for me, it was all peace and love and let's all work together. Not to uh, cast aspersions on Bob Zemeckis, but he was a very competitive fellow. By the time he got to the, uh, we call him 480, this was the course where you make longer movie, color, sync, sound, you got a five-man crew and probably some other people. He was really fostering this us against them since you could feel the way he, he and his group sort of teamed up together so i think to answer your question it's totally reflective of a personality thing some people grouped together some people were kind of wide open i should mention too that uh, john after all was still there when i first went and his classmate dan o'bannon was working alongside him and they were working on dark star who w generated that initial idea to make that particular movie was it the two john and dan both or yeah, did they... john john take the lead or dan take the lead on that well i Certainly, I wasn't in the room for most of that early stuff. They co-wrote the script. So right there, you can get a sense they were working together and jamming on an idea that I'm sure when it was born, neither of them had any idea that it would sort of explode into much more of an ambitious project than it was in the beginning. They co-wrote it. And then as students, it was pretty ambitious stuff. They had elaborate sets and they were doing miniatures and star fields. It was thrilling for me because uh, film school was exciting enough getting to help them on some of that early stuff. I was learning as much from them as I was from my classes, just helping out. The Dark Star what, took three years, four years, something like that to make the into what it ended up? I suppose. I They were at it down at USC, I'm sure, for at least a year. And then they uh, kind of liberated it from USC and stretched it into a feature. I got some outside money, kept shooting more footage, got, got it blown up to 35, uh, all of which took time. So yeah, probably three years or more. Which, which you know, is not unusual because I have a film that's actually out in the world right now as we speak. It was my first movie ever to receive true distribution. It's called Devil's Five. It won Best Horror Film back in 2018 at the Hell's Kitchen Festival in New York City. Hey, congratulations. But, thank you, thank you. But it was an anthology, so... You 
know, Devil's Five, so it's five movies about the devil. I directed three of the five. My other two partners made the other two. But it really took us about four years. You have to be dedicated. It, there's, that's all there is to it. I, it. That story gets told over and over again. If you, th those who, uh, those who are, are faint of heart will fall by the wayside. You really have to be determined gritty grittily determined to get something to go all the way so when you started work on dark star you were a sound effects editor no that came a little bit later first of all anybody down at usc there was, there was this one room with about i don't know a dozen movie olas which way back in the day was the way you edited a movie machine that runs picture and sound in sync and so that was a, a chaotic room and i suppose you could say i started learning how to edit sound in that room the thing you're referring to didn't happen until John's second feature, Assault on Precinct 13. How did that come about? Because obviously there's a little bit of time between when John must have finished Dark Star, made Assault. What were you doing at that point? Did you have a clear-cut path to the industry or did John just reach out to you? Well, both things happened at once. I don't know how clear-cut my path was, but people who come out of film school have already by that point figured out that unless they've just got a golden ticket or they're just phenomenally lucky, they're going to have to scrabble around find a gig here a gig there some people might go out line up a job loading coats in the coolers on a some kind of big feature or something like that other people like me i kept picking up work art and directing commercials you know cheap ass commercials for uh, grocery stores and department stores and things like that and also editing other commercials like the ones that pretend to prove that look this little bit of instant glue, crazy glue, will hold up this entire truck off the truck, <laughs> which was a fucking lie, you know? I mean, I was in the cutting room. It's like, wait, that that let, that job didn't last long, because I said, wait, it didn't do that. And the guy said, cut it together and make it look like it did. Come to Hollywood. So those are the kind of jobs I was getting. And I was trying, I was writing, of course, all the time, trying to get that going, because uh, until that point, really developed any any writing skills at all. I was paying whatever bills I had at that time by just pick up jobs like that. Or somebody would call me and say, hey, uh, you want to help out on this thing? We're going to go, Jerry Lewis is doing interview. Uh, we need somebody to help like the show. Okay. So go over to this hotel and there's Jerry Lewis on a sofa and it's got some lights and you light it up. Somebody gives you a hundred bucks or something. Those kind of gigs. The way, what you were really doing was networking, although we didn't call it that. And in the midst of all of that, yeah, John called and said, hey, I'm going to do this movie. You want to be involved? My original involvement on, uh, it was not called Assault on Precinct 13 at that point. It was called the Anderson Alamo. Anderson being the police station. He had fallen out with Dan O'Bannon by that point because had he not I'm sure Dan would have partnered with him as art director or uh, production designer. But uh, he and Dan weren't communicating right then. And so uh, he asked me if I wanted to do the uh, art direction, which was a big leap for me because I built sets for Dark Star, but I was still kind of unofficial. I didn't know really all the ropes. So it was a big learning experience to build a real official giant elaborate film set, a, a full length feature. That was, that was the beginning of that. This sort of two job combination came about because uh, when we finished filming, film's in the can, now John's off to the cutting room and it's low budget, so he was cutting his own material. I went to see him at the cutting room because I was feeling a little bereft. Okay, in film school, you, the movie doesn't go away as soon as it's shot, it's in your hands and you start working on it. So I was feeling on the outside. I went to see him, said, hey, give me something to do. He said, can you cut sound effect? And I said, sure, without even knowing what the job really was. <laughs> there we were in that cutting room. That was a lot of fun. I, I learned a lot during that time on Assault on Precinct 13. And the sound effects for the movie turned out really, really well. How long was the shoot of Assault? I can't remember it. None of these uh, early filming schedules were very long, so it couldn't have been more than, you know, three, four weeks. That makes sense, because that's kind of what would be my guess. When Carpenter asked you to be production designer and co-editor on Halloween, <laughs> obviously, you're talking a, a couple years later, he had done a TV movie in between there. Then after that... Then someone's watching. Yes. Now, did he ever ask you to be involved with that, or was that because it was TV? It, it, it was, that was fully unionized. There would have been 
no opening for me. Bless his heart, he did uh, get me to do storyboard on, on uh, someone watching it. I helped with those. Yeah, he called me uh, because uh, Halloween, which wasn't called Halloween at first, it was the babysitter murders. He did ask me to be the editor and the uh, production designer. The co-editing credit came along because I hired Charles Bornstein to be my assistant, a really well, well qualified assistant editor. Because remember, I'm, I'm just uh, more or less faking it. I didn't have a deep well of experience in, in this world. I just had good instincts as a cutter. So Charles organized the cutting room, proved to be so helpful that I just gave him co-credit. Was he a student with you at uh, your school? Or no, no, Charles, well, he actually came out of Spielberg world. He had been one of the assistants for Mike Kahn on Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So he came along and just proved to be invaluable in every way. Now, um, did you notice a big difference from the production level between Assault and Halloween? was Did they feel the same when you were doing them, or did oh, you no. feel a difference? Both films would have benefited greatly from more powerful first assistant direct. In both cases, John was really, had a lot of weight on his shoulders, and it, only in looking back, uh, I think he would agree with me, neither film benefited from a really powerful first AD. That's getting down into the weeds of how movies get made. To anybody who really wants to make a good movie, you need some good production people. And on set, if you have a first assistant director who really knows their stuff and organize the set and can get things done you save so much time you get so much more shooting time to try new angles and stuff on both of those films that was an area that was a little if it, it was still early days and so things this was a lot of scotch tape and chewing gum still flying by the seat of our pants later i suppose it came out of the cutting room that we started calling these movies uh, little rascals go make a movie we barely knew what we were doing both assault and halloween were organized shoots Deborah Hill stepped up between the two. She was the script supervisor on Assault. She and John became an item and a couple eventually. We all thought when Halloween came along and she was announced as producer, first reaction was like, all oh, right, yeah. She was script supervisor and now she's gonna produce. <laughs> Only it turned out she was brilliant at the job. She was really a good, solid producer. That was evident from day one on Halloween that we now had someone in that department, along with Dean Cundy, who really helped the uh, production. And she brought well. Dean, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, they had worked on many movies before that, kind of pot boiler movies, low budget, quickies. They were veterans together, and Deborah brought him to the party. So here's a here's a big one I have to ask you, because I know you've told the story many times, I'm sure. For the people who watch my show, I, I don't know if they've heard it. Obviously, you played a huge role in the way Michael Myers looks. That mask, when I, when I saw Halloween in 78, I was 13 years old, and it really scared me. It had a huge impact on me. Yeah. And by that what I mean is the next day I remember going to a baseball field we weren't it was not a game just me and a bunch of my friends on a diamond and I'm on the pitching mound and I remember I'm sitting there getting ready to throw a ball a hard ball at this guy and I'm thinking about Michael you know in the clothesline Michael's face coming out of the hallway with Jamie before he stabs her Michael sitting up by the closet I couldn't get those images out of my head to tell you the truth it had such an impact on me it was the movie that started my interest in getting involved with filmmaking I didn't know wow. I was going to be directing I didn't know I was going to write produce I just thought I think I want to be involved in films and again I didn't know anything about it. I was completely ignorant, whatever you want to call it, naive. What ended up happening was four years later, now I was a horror fan since I was a little boy. I, I wasn't a necessarily a filmmaker. The Universal Monsters, Godzilla, even some of the Hammer films, famous monsters of Filmland magazine. I liked horror films, but it wasn't really until Halloween hit me, like right between the eyes. After Halloween, I started paying more attention to films. And remember, at the time, there's no internet. So you didn't really have a way of learning unless you went to film school or something like that, especially a kid in middle school and high school. Four years later, I went and saw John Carpenter's The Thing. Now, at that time, I'm being honest, I didn't really associate it was the same guy. Like, I just yeah. went because I saw a commercial with these monsters. I watched the movie. I saw it opening weekend, June of 82. It completely blew me away in every way. Not just the brilliant effects by Rob Bottin, but the score, the acting, that paranoia between all those guys in this kind of isolated place. Believe it or not, 
not, Tommy. It's when I walked out of the theater after watching the movie. I looked up at the poster and I said, wait a second. That's <laughs> the same guy's name that made Halloween. And it was at that very second. And believe it or not, I'd seen the opening credits. John Carpenter is the thing. It didn't hit me until after the movie. And when I saw that, I said to myself at that very moment, he did that to me twice. I've got to do what he did to me. It was at that moment it decided to be a director. Here's my big question to you. When I look at John's work from Dark Star all the way to his The Ward, when I look at the crew and the people that worked with him, especially on Assault, Halloween, The Fog, Escape from New York, The Thing, you know, Christine, Starman, Big Trouble, Prince, They Live. That group was kind of a, a lot of the same people, especially yeah. those Cundy you, yeah. Nick Castle, when that team changed, when he brought in a new DP, brought in new editors, new composers, with, or just doing it himself, I felt like it changed the way his films were. And I'm not trying to be nasty with John's work, and I'm not trying to make you say something that might make you uncomfortable. How do you feel about when that band of you guys that were working together changed? Because, I mean, maybe it was your choice, maybe it was John's choice. I just think the movies were not as good. I look at George Romero, too. When Romero was working with that that team of people Pasquale Bubba John Harrison all, all these guys in Pittsburgh Martin Dawn of the Dead Creep Show, The Crazy there was a great energy when he changed that team his movies were not as good how do you feel about that I'm not trying to have you say something bad about your friend I, I think it's inevitable that it's very hard to keep the old group together to use a musical analogy you know how was it when uh, Brian Jones died that Rolling Stones changed and so forth uh, you can go on and on things run their natural natural course. Had the circumstances been a little different, I might have stuck with John all the way. You can only be one director on a movie, or I suppose that uh, rule is broken these days. The way we saw it back then, I I was so involved on Hog. I remember late one night in the cutting room, we had to do a massive redo on that movie in order to uh, make it what it turned out to be. I'm in the cutting room and we're talking about, okay, the reshoot, what we're going to do with the reshoot. And it was very much a collaboration, but there came a moment when John looked at me and I, it was over some question, long forgotten, whatever the specifics were. But he said, I can't let you direct my movie. Of course, he was right. I was headed into a situation where I wanted to direct movies. I wanted to write my own. I guess it was Escape from New York came up. He gave me the great honor of inviting me to be the editor. I was going to ask you that question about Escape. Did he ask you to get involved? I think he knew better than to ask me to be the uh, production designer because I was so much more ambitious and I still still was more or less faking it as a production designer. So he, he very smartly talking to uh, more uh, experienced veterans about doing production design. But he asked if I'd like to be the editor. I mused about it, but at the same time, see, I was looking for writing gigs. I was getting my own material out, looking for a directing gig. Uh, I passed on it. But other opportunities came up when he went very, this huge deal came down when he started doing his truly independent movies. Uh, this was later on. Uh, when he set up a film company. This was the days of They Live and Prince of Darkness. And he, we talked about me becoming involved as a player with him as some kind of partner or, or permanent employee or something. But we never could quite work out the deal because again, to be, I was a good co-pilot. I was a good right-hand man for John. And it could have been a successful collaboration again and again. Uh, and of course we co-wrote several times along the way in order to to do that, it would mean taking myself out of the marketplace as a writer and director for years. And that didn't feel like the right career move for me. Uh, it didn't work out. Same for Dean. I don't know. I don't think they actually had a falling out, but there, were, there came a point after several successful movies together, John just went another way. And I think Dean also, he got involved with Zemeckis and Spielberg. Very, very tricky to have the same team go on and on and on and on. And in fact, might not even be advisable. If you do that, you're in danger of repeating yourself. You take a great artist like Bob Dylan, he kept evolving. Imagine if after uh, he had written Blowing in the Wind and a few of the 
other sort of anthems of that time. If he had tried to just stay in that little niche, it would have killed him. He would have been dead. You know, there's something to be said for just letting things evolve as they will. I don't know if I can agree with you about his movies not being as good. I personally thought they lived with really, really fun, strong moments. Not trying to say that I disliked them, but there was a magic yeah, to those. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. And, and you know, I, I actually said it to John one time. I, I met John when he showed Ghosts of Mars at the Directors Guild Theater in New York City. And I waited till the end after everybody had signed autographs and posters. And I, I spent maybe 15 minutes with him outside just talking. I said to him, I said, what you did between 78 and 88, I don't think will ever be done by any other director ever. Which was, you know, Halloween, The Fog, Elvis, Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, Starman, Big Trouble in China. Prince of Darkness and They Live. I said, different kind of movies there, impact and powerfulness of each one of those films. Yeah. I said, and then the amount, just the amount of film. Yeah. Nobody nobody makes films like that now. So, and he said to me, what did you think of my films afterwards? I, I want to hear your story about how you chose the Michael Myers mask because obviously that played a big part in my life and so many other people since then. How you came to that iconic, terrifying nightmare of an image that as soon as you see it, it scares you. The script described the mask as a something human but nondescript that the rubber somehow was uh, distorted the face it was pretty vague the way it described it and as a matter of fact i think i put that in my book oh let me stop and plug my book yeah please oh you know what can i plug it too for you yeah. i just finished reading it <laughs> okay <laughs> there you go <laughs> It was a it was a strange description and left very open to interpretation. As a matter of fact, it occurred to me while I was writing the book that John may have actually entertained the notion at one point of just using the human face if he could. After I came up with the mask, that solved that problem because all you had to do was point the camera at that thing and you had a scary shot. This was a super low budget movie. We were on a terribly pressured pre-production schedule. The whole movie was uh, very short, even shorter than most TV movie schedules. There was not about to be time enough to design a mask and then do a prototype, come up with it again. That's what a big studio would have done, and it would have taken several weeks. Didn't have time for that. I needed to go out and find something that in some way, shape, or form would work. Off I went. Hollywood Boulevard has, I believe it's called Hollywood Toys and Novelty, still there in an expanded version and I went in there and looked and what they had predominantly were they, they didn't have that many full head masks they had a lot of you know strap-on masks but I knew we'd need a full head so I looked down the line of of masks they had in that category and there was Richard Nixon and there was John Wayne and Gerald Ford it was evident right away they were all cartoonized too you know Richard Nixon had this big stupid nose and everything and there was a uh, clown mask Emmett Kelly sad sack type of clown I was thinking man I don't know I don't I don't see it. I don't see how this is going to work. And then down way at the end were a couple Star Trek masks. There was Spock, pointy ears and everything. And next to him was this kind of blank face guy. Supposed to be Captain Kirk. Didn't look like William Shatner. It just looked like a blank face. And then the light bulb went on. It's like, ah, blank face. Okay. So I bought one of those. I also bought an Emmett Kelly mask just in case, you know, just in case this experiment didn't work out. Took it home. I had a little work shop out in my garage started fooling around with it for two reasons one i wanted to personalize it two john had cautioned me that whatever we bought off the shelf we ought to alter in some way just to protect ourselves so some of it was just pure practicality and some of it was created in any event i widened the eye holes so that uh, the actor could see better i yanked off the sideburns right away it was starting to get weird it, it was looking strange taking the sideburns away had a big effect because this is something that like at that era punks were doing this sort of thing you know for their personal fashion and it was like what that did something i uh darkened the hair with uh streaks and tips were a big movie prop everywhere streaks and tips are something that cinematographers use to take down a bright spot in the background and just spray it on it's it's uh basically a hair dye, washable hair dye. So I darkened his hair, messed it up. It was all very neat, combed back, which is the way a lot of collectors do it now. And every time they come up to my table or confront me with one of their masks, I say, give me that thing. And <laughs> fuck it up real good. I got out the old Krylon appliance white spray paint, painted the whole thing fish belly white, just minor adjustments. There's a 
out there on YouTube, there's uh, uh, I got with Sean Clark. We did a Captain Kirk mask together, so you can refer to that to see exactly how I did it. There I had that, and it looked pretty weird, I must admit. It was like, wow, okay, that's something. That's, that's a serious candidate. So the next day, I went down to the rented office, this skanky offices that we were renting <laughs> for a few, a few weeks. We auditioned the mask. Nick wasn't around. I don't know where he was, but I, I always just put him in the story because I can't remember who actually modeled the masks for us. First mask, the clown mask, came out, you know, modeled it around. I think I'd already decided on a jumpsuit. That wasn't hard to come by. My partner, eventually, who became my wife, Nancy, then Loomis, who played the part of Annie in the movie, but was also the costumer. Uh, between us, we came up with a jumpsuit that was just, you know, what you wanted it to do was just go away, just not even be noticeable as an yes. element. The guy put that on and then put on the clown mask and came out. And I must admit, it was eerie. Wow, that's great. We've got one that's going to work no matter what. So we've yes. got one in our pocket before we even auditioned the other one. As a side note, it came in handy that that clown eeriness came in handy later on it, which I did several years after that yes it just that notion of a clown you know stephen king had written it but i'd already experimented with it filmically and knew that it would be anyway then uh, the guy comes out wearing the uh star trek alteration i'm telling you the the room just went silent it was eerie it was like oh fuck me that is the scariest thing i've ever seen to this day i don't quite understand the visceral power of it but it's there closest i can come is the feeling i got if you've ever watched a movie called seconds by john frankenheim i have not seen it well i'll catch it sometime it's it's an eerie scary movie that's not trying to it, it's not a horror movie at all. Rock Hudson, in one of his most interesting roles, there is a moment when he is all wrapped up, a little bit like the Invisible Man, all wrapped up in this thing. And the just that image of someone covered, their face covered, but these dead eye holes, that's viscerally frightening. And that was the echo for me when I saw our shape come out of the dressing room. We knew we had a winner. It was like, okay, forget the script, forget the music that's going to be playing, forget all of it. Just taking a picture of that We've got a scary movie. You actually played the shape in a few yes. moments. of the, I believe you were at the closet when Jamie Lee's in. That's correct. Were you I, the guy also on the floor who sits up? No, that's Nick. And what about in the hallway right before she gets stabbed when he comes out of the darkness? That's Nick also. It, it worked like this. Because I was the art director, I knew exactly when we had to prepare something to be broken, a door to be busted through, a glass to be broken, the closet slats to be torn down. That's a job for the guy who prepared the set. And because Nick and I were pretty much the same size, I could put on the shape mask, the uh, outfit, not to mention the fact that some of these things we were doing at three in the morning. It was like, hey, let Nick go home. You know, <laughs> he's tired. I was the utility shape. Anytime we were going to have contact with the set, I would do the breaking. That was the formula. But by the way, I I've got to mention to you that I think that you're editing. I believe I read this in your book because I did finish your book. It's fantastic. I highly recommend it. I loved it. And I'm a big fan of Halloween 3, which we have to get to, of course. The moments in Halloween where you're seeing the house, the staircase, this room, they're just still shots with nobody in them. The yeah. beginning of the fog. We're seeing a, a a, a gas tank, a, a something falls down on the ground, you're seeing it flow yeah. in a store, the stuff shake. That that stillness, it really creates tension. And that was you, right? Yes. I will take a certain amount of credit for especially the uh, montage at the end of Halloween, because that certainly was not scripted that way. If you had been in the cutting room, we were stealing shots from that were never intended as still shots. That is to say, okay, the shape is supposed to enter the frame over here. Ready? Okay, roll camera. Roll, camera's rolling, and here's this picture of an empty street. And then, and, and action! And here the shape walks in and goes over there and does something. So we were stealing like every frame of that shot to represent a still moment. I'm the one who hung on when the shape looks at his handiwork hanging up on the wall, and you just hold for an extraordinarily long time. I'm a big advocate of just sometimes, especially in an action kind of oriented movie, 
where there's going to be chases or there's going to be suspense, a hook moment. One of the most effective things you can do is create some kind of humor and let the audience back down. And another thing you can do is just stand fucking still. Hold, hold, hold. Now go. There's rhythm involved. And John, I think, is is also really good at that. It comes comes out of his music, too, I think. He, I believe that he treats film to some degree. Once he's in the cutting room, he treats it a lot like music. Uh, he has a great instinct for that stuff. So, uh, and it carried over because uh, those sequences you're referring to in the fog were added later. They were not part of the original cut. That's a, a nice comment on John's courage. We put that movie together, The Fog. This was virtually the same crew. Speaking of, of your point earlier, the virtually the same crew that moved from Halloween to The Fog. Pretty nearly intact. Crew members right right down the line. So you would assume, hey, piece of cake. This is going to be great. We got three times as much money. Uh, nobody thought to themselves that, wait, it's far more than three times as ambitious a movie. That, <laughs> that didn't become obvious until we were in it. You would assume that, okay, this is just really going to be great. But the first cut, first day in the cutting room, the first obvious cut, okay, I'm going from this wide shot to this closer shot, and it bumped. It didn't, it wasn't smooth. It didn't work. Now, you explain to me how it is that that would be the case. It wasn't anybody's fault, certainly not John's. It just was a harder movie to put together. It didn't want to work. So we struggled and we struggled and we struggled and we finally got it together. John put his music to it and we played it to a very select few people. Well, you know, it just sat there. At the time, I thought I was being really optimistic and thinking, well, yeah, it's pretty good. You know, it has its moments. John stood up in front of us and he said, this thing doesn't work. We've got to do something. And I thought, wow, the courage it took him to not, we were all worn out by that point. We were exhausted. He could have said, okay, we'll just turn it in. It's pretty good. He didn't. He went back. I think he had to make some sacrifices to get some more money out of, I guess it was Avco Embassy. And But he did. We sat down in the cutting room in this blinding, like two and a half week period. We shot new footage. We edited footage, put it in the movie, tried to make it seamless. John wrote an entire new score. And those still shots you're talking about, I think that was an echo of what what happened on Halloween. By then, we had learned the effectiveness of such moments. We're sure enough going to try and employ them to help this movie get over the top. Sometimes the simplicity is most effective, right? Well, it creates expectation. You're looking at a series of shots that, that when, when you put them together, they mean something. And your brain is engaged. You're trying to keep up with the movie at that point. You're not ahead of it. You're being told new information constantly, but it's all still. That creates its own kind of tension. It's just mechanics. I loved it. I think it's an underrated classic. It's got so much mood to it. The shots with the lepers in the back of the frame, those those silhouetted, whether it's Tom Atkins there or Jamie Lee Curtis or Michael Myers, is that John or is that Dean Moore that always likes that two things in the frame, in the foreground or background, either way in focus sometimes out of focus you know it could be a combination but who is that more coming from is that john's vision or dean's well, kind of impl implementation i think you'd have to give john the first part of the credit on that because he insisted on anamorphic panavision anamorphic now that's a big wide screen once you've got it up there on the wall you have to do something with it it's if you just take pictures, just some guy standing there, you're not really using the frame. You might as well be shooting it, you know, in a square. But when you've got that wide screen, you've got so many opportunities to either make it a big lonely frame with some object way in the back or fill it up with 17 people. It's such a wonderful medium to work in. And John insisted on that from uh, Assault on Precinct 13 going forward. He gets a lot of credit, but then you've got to hand it to Dean Cundy, who had the know-how and the lighting skills to take that idea and run with it. Halloween 3, they offer you Halloween 2. John and Deborah offer you Halloween 2 to direct it. You turn it down, which makes so much sense to me now. <laughs> you look at the, not that I hate Halloween 2. It's got some of the qualities with Dean shooting it, John's music with Hoff, Howarth and all that. But story-wise, you know, it's not there. So, <laughs> so when they came with 3, obviously you took it. What was your What was your goal? I know you wanted to make a pod movie instead of a knife movie, but what was your goal what were you really going to try to say with that film because 
I, I went and saw it on opening night because the first Halloween had affected me so much. <laughs> uh, by that point, I was a big fan. I went and saw Halloween 2 opening weekend as well. Didn't like it as much. But when 3 came out, I actually took a girl. It was I think it was the third girl I dated. We went opening night, October 22nd, 1982. We went to the biggest theater in my hometown, Everett, Washington. This is big old theater. As soon as that computerized pumpkin came up on the screen with the credits and John and Hofworth's music came on, I was hooked. Oh, I mean, good. I, I didn't care that there was no Michael Myers. I was hooked in from, I'm talking the first seconds. You know, uh, your story reflects closely. Uh, there's a note in the beginning of the Halloween 3 book by an old friend, uh, Bruce Harrison Smith. His experience reflects fairly closely your experience. He loved the movie on the first view. He was with a date. <laughs> He was intending to make out with her through the whole movie because he assumed it would be crap. <laughs> but his compliment to me was, we never got around to making out. Uh, well, let me back up a step because uh, you made the part about Halloween 2 and me turning it down sound like I just turned it down as soon as it was offered, which wasn't the case. I was on the movie and going to direct the movie for... I guess it was a few weeks there while John and Deborah were getting it all firmed up and John was writing. I had envisioned uh, Halloween 2 would be a five years later model, something that was, uh, okay, time has gone by, this poor traumatized girl, uh, Laurie Strode, is now very tentatively getting out of her shell and going off to college, trying her best to get back on her feet after. Let's acknowledge this was a fucking huge trauma in anybody's life. I, I was thinking on those terms, and in truth, the idea I was having had more in common with H2O, if you saw that movie. A confined space like a, a college with walls around it, far from being a secure spot turned into a kind of prison, can be turned fairly easily with a few bicycle chains into a prison. That was my whole notion, but John and Deborah were pretty strong on the idea of a five minutes later sequel. Can't say they were wrong. There was the, uh, the simple box office fact that a lot of people liked it. A lot of people bought tickets and went and were satisfied with the outcome. I see t-shirts, you know, that's their favorite movie. It's, the truth was that uh, I had participated in what I still consider to be one of the best horror movies ever made, Halloween. And we did it using all the old tricks, virtually no gore, no blood involved. It was not a slasher movie, although it could be credited with kicking off the slasher movie phenomenon that followed. But I thought it was a real masterpiece, immensely proud of it. And when I I read the script of Halloween 2, I was just utterly dismayed. I just thought it was a betrayal of everything we'd done before that. Total exploitation, just for the money. I suppose a, a, a shrewder career move would have been to just shut up and do it. But I think not just for my own pride, but also I did have the notion that, hey, John and Deborah deserve a director who likes the movie. That would be kind of shitty to go in there and fake it instead of handing it off to somebody who says like, gung-ho, I can do this. I love this. I want to do this. That's who they needed uh, to direct their movie and that wasn't me i just couldn't so i was flabbergasted when deborah called me about halloween 3 and these are friends of course but in hollywood you say no to somebody generally they don't take kindly to it and you may never hear from them now john and deborah were exceptions especially john our friendship really was a deep bond it went way back but still it was a pleasant surprise the call went something like deborah saying would you be interested in halloween 3 and in the time it took me to take a deep breath and prepare to say fuck no if halloween if i said no to halloween 2 can i could only imagine the gore fest <laughs> that would take place you know this is like the arms race of violence by this point Yes. You're going to have to like chop people in half and hang them up on meat hooks. I was getting all wound up to say no, and she said, it's not going to be a thing like the other two. No shape, no babysitters, no nothing. Okay, I'll do it. You know, just so the idea that it's like, oh no, I want to do a pod movie instead of a knife. It wasn't like that. It was just, if it's not going to try to be a gore fest sequel to Halloween, I'm in. I can do this. I, I can throw myself into it with all the enthusiasm in the world. You know, I sort of took it on faith that something good would come of it, and I believe it did. There's no, no doubt about it. I, I think you should stay. I'm very proud of the movie. Honestly, if you look at all the Halloweens, especially the most recent ones, which, you know, you know Tommy, I, 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 I'm not a guy that tries to attack other filmmakers or, you know, get nasty, because I know God knows the internet will do that. When I looked at the last three Halloween films that came out by that same director, I couldn't find 
find one shot that stayed with me. You know, when I came off the first Halloween, where there were so many moments you could never forget, to where you have a guy who made three movies of roughly 300 minutes worth of film, and not have one shot that could stay with me. That really says something about today's filmmaking, or and, and, and how good you guys were back then. How did it, how was it like to work with Deborah on that movie? Because I think John was busy on The Thing or Christine or whatever else. It was you The know, Thing. He was in post-production on The Thing. Yeah, so you were really working. Deborah must have been... I think she never gets the credit that she really deserves because she co-wrote Halloween, right, with John, co-wrote The Fog with John, produced those movies, you know, made this movie with you. I think she was one of the big parts of that whole success, right? Yeah. I Well, I hope uh, I hope my book helps set the record straight because I, I do credit her with a lot. It was great to be back in the fold. It was going to be uh, a privileged position because, after all, sweetest part of the deal was, for me, uh, Dean's coming, his entire crew, all of which you're buddies with already. So there was a lot of built-in good vibes going. And not to diminish John's role too much, he wasn't involved day to day, but he and I were very heavily invested in the script. Uh, after Nigel turned in his version, we figured out pretty quickly there was a lot of work left to do before we could shoot. That was John and me collaborating. Then he did a draft. Then I rewrote him before we finally got to the shooting day. It was a major collaborative effort in it, but it felt good. This was all buddies. These were all friends. I trusted them and I couldn't have ever asked for a better debut situation. Every director gets out there. Your first time, feature film, a lot riding on it. There's pressure. you got people who are giving you the kind of support every director deserves. It was a privilege. Deborah and, was responsible for a tremendous amount of that. And, and you know, I've got to give John credit for something you wrote in your book that I thought was, I don't mean to give away your book too much or whatever. I guess there was a screening or someone saw the movie and they didn't know whether the oh. end should be changed. And you, John contacted you and asked you, and you said to keep it the same. You said that John supported that. That's an amazing thing on a first-time director to get approval by a producer that had done these other successful films. The fact that John supported you that way, that says so much about you and him both. John treated me the way he likes to be treated and insists on being treated as a director. He gave me that same privilege. When push came to shove, in effect, I had I had final cut. It just blew me away because believe me, I knew my position on the movie and if John had said, Tommy, listen, I really need you to do something about the ending. They're all over me, a lot of pressure. Could you dream up something that mitigates this, that lets the audience off the hook? I wouldn't have liked it, but because of our friendship, had he asked me to do that, I would have done it. He asked me my opinion. How did I feel about it? I told him the truth, which was I thought it was good the way it was. And when he said, OK, that's how it's going to be, that's astonishing and and incredibly rare and i think it was the right choice in my opinion it well, was the right choice as an audience well, member it should have been that way on the invasion of the body snatchers i'm talking about the original kevin mccarthy you're next you're next <laughs> That should have been the end of that movie. So oh. I, in a way, I did it for Don Siegel, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, to, to right the wrong that had been done to that movie. I got to mention, I really enjoyed the Big Trouble Little China song <laughs> that you, John, and Nick created. John created it. We Nick and I were, in effect, just tagging along. We were almost like extra. Is there is there any recording of you guys with your band, the Coupe de Villes, beyond that? That's ever I've never seen it or heard it. I'd love to hear that. Uh, oh, well, there's an album. It's called waiting out the 80s it's all john's compositions i feel like uh, it would have been nice to get nick in there because he's also a really good poser of pop tunes but it was john's project and uh, nick and i participated as best we could i threw in some backup vocals and i think i did one lead vocal, played some guitar on it and same for nick but it was that project was driven by john and there's also some renegade tape out there of a rap party we did with just acoustic guitars playing john and nick's compositions i I rewatched it. I started rewatching Friday Night Part Two. Oh, thank you. I know you've done so much TV movies and all that, but I was really kind of focusing on the movies, you know. Yeah, it, Friday Night Part Two deserves a closer look because it it is a good movie and it's a beautiful movie thanks to uh, Mark Irwin and Dean Cheddar and their crew. It was star crossed. I don't know if you know the story, but just before it was released, the man who was in charge of releasing it was murdered. Jose Menendez was his name, and you may recall the famous murder 
murders. Uh, he and his wife were shotgunned to death, and it turned out the culprits were their sons, Eric and Lyle Menendez. Oh, my God. Those guys murdered their parents just by chance, also murdered the chances of my movie at the box office because uh, it never got a proper release. Oh, my God, that's terrible. When you look back on Fright Night 2, how did that come to you after Tom Holland's original film? I was friends with uh, a couple of people who worked in this boutique studio called Vista Pictures. Miguel Tejada Flores was the story department there. It was a small operation, one man per department, one woman. And uh, Miguel and I were friends, I guess, through mutual friends. You know how it goes in uh, any business, especially in Hollywood. Miguel brought me in on a, another show that never got made. It was a, a like a computer. Everybody was doing computer cracking movies in that middle 80s period. And so I rewrote a script that somebody else had done and got to know some of the people over there. So when the idea came up for uh, Fright Night Part 2, my name was in the basket, you might say. This often happens, you know. I think I got the gig just because I was buddies with enough people over there by that point that they felt like I was a known quantity. It's always hard to bring in uh, when you're starting a project and you're going to spend many millions of bucks on it. Uh, you want to bring in somebody that you feel confident about. It sure helps if you've been around those offices and they friends with just whoever's around. I'm sure that helped get me that gig. It worked out just great. I'd still love to see that get a good Blu-ray release because it's a beautiful looking movie. Did you choose uh, Mark Irwin from uh, David Cronenberg's films? Yeah, he was his talents waiting to be tapped, you know. Good, good shooter, fun to work with, easy to work with. I thought he had a great touch. Brad Fidel, who had done such a brilliant job on Jim Cameron's The Terminator, which I, one of my three favorite films. He had created that great music for the first Fright Night, so why not continue, right? Yeah, with Ross, uh, oh geez, I'm blanking on the last name, the electric violin. Look up his name and insert it in, across the bottom of the screen in your interview, because Ross deserves a lot of credit too. Yeah, Brad, uh, that theme, original, we had to have it. He did a great job, Brad did. Now, was Stephen King involved much when you made the tv version of it only from across the country we corresponded i've never met him we corresponded mail mail he he wasn't involved in any day-to-day -day type situation has he ever told you what he thought of your version yeah he, he liked it very much he was complimentary he regretted that we didn't have more time to refine the special effects uh, i second that motion but uh, <laughs> there you go you know uh, what are you going to do i feel like we got by with that stuff and our secret weapon on that movie really was the kids and the adults. I believe those kids grew up to be those adults. So the casting of that movie, I think, was our big secret weapon. But people forget, I think, or or they mistakenly just think Stephen King is all about scary. But Stephen King, I think, is the master of the rites of passage of childhood. I think that's really his wheelhouse. And I think that's the secret to our version of it. And, and where did you film that? Vancouver. This will sound sacrilegious to some people, especially after the box office performance of the movies, It. But there's a lot of what I like more about your movie show, whatever you want to call it, versus the feature film. I find some of it, uh, some of it more attractive in certain ways from your TV movie than even those last two feature films. Well, thank you. No disrespect to them. I, I applaud their success. But I never could get past the fact that they're Pennywise, to me, looked scary to begin with and it's like wait no child in their right mind would go anywhere near that he's too scary whereas tim curry's pennywise when he didn't have his sharp teeth showing was a fun clown he was kind of appealing and like, oh georgie you know he really nailed that it was hard for me to get past that fact of their movie is it they made a really scary clown from the get-go. But you're breaking the rule. What kid would go near that thing? You're right. And also there's there's that that lack of contrast. You know, sometimes if you want something to be scary, you almost like have a laugh before the scare. Absolutely. And if you just go scare to scare, a little bit one note. I think that's kind of a secret that's oftentimes lost uh, in modern filmmaking is people get scary mixed all up with gory and violent, torture porn. Scary is scary, and it doesn't 
necessarily, I, it really involves, uh, well, I ran into trouble on a movie I did called Vampires Los Muertos. That was uh, back around 2000 or so. That was with John Bon Jovi, right? Yeah. We shot down in Mexico and the shoot went very well. But in post-production, I ran into an executive of the company, my boss, who, when I started talking about, he was vetoing this and saying this didn't work and all that. And I said, listen, don't you understand? You need humor. You need humor because you're going to jolt people. You're going to tear them down into this dark place. So start someplace up here. And he said, we're not having humor in my mood. I thought, all right, we're dead. It's never going to work because the guy doesn't understand horror movies. Talk, talk about the your star of that movie, John Bon Jovi. I'm a heavy metal hard rock guy, right? I grew yeah. up that way. This is off the cuff of your, your movie. Back in 1984, I went to a concert in Seattle at the Paramount Theater. It was a band called Rat, which at the time were not known. They did yeah. not have that. Round and Round was not out yet. They had an EP out. Because I was on the West Coast, all the heavy metal guys we liked to like, trade tapes at that time etc. Yeah. So we went to go see Rat and when we get to the, the Paramount there's this big line of people and the sign says Rat opening for Bon Jovi and I go, I go, what the hell is Bon Jovi? I didn't even know how to say it. <laughs> and they said, oh, those, those guys from New Jersey. Right. And I'm like they're going to suck. Because you know, <laughs> I was a West Coast guy, right? Yeah. So we watched the show and Rat puts on a great show and then bon jovi came out and they blew us away they were heavier back then than bon jovi is recently yeah. i just remember saying that guy's gonna be a big star and he he, he is yeah he's one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet but a very steely sort of ambition that he doesn't you know it doesn't get in the way or anything uh, but you can tell he's super determined to just keep himself and his band on top. He took his acting very seriously. I, he told me afterwards that it was the best experience he'd ever had on set, being in front of a camera. I think it's just because I kept saying, John, don't worry about it. Just, just relax. Find some truth in this thing. You don't have to, like, act. Forget that. Just be here. Be with the scene. Find some truth. You're going to be fine, you know? So I think he gave a good performance. How do you think he liked the movie afterwards? Did he ever tell you? We never discussed that. The fact that it didn't do what we both imagined it might, not a subject you just want to run down, sit right down with a beer and start talking about. <laughs> and John, no matter what else, he carries an aura of success about him. so i don't think he looked upon it as anything that was going to help him advance his career or his intentions by the way i don't think i'm telling any secrets but he has a secret ambition to get into politics really secret i don't think it's a secret he he's let it be known before but i think he'd be great he's certainly got the personality and the looks and, and the charisma recognition. And right. the charisma, recognition, fact, all that stuff. And he's got a good brain in his head. So uh, I'd love to see him go out there and do something politically. No doubt. Well, all I can say, Tommy, is that uh, this is a brilliant book. For those who have not read it, you should go out of your way to see it read this. I'm so happy that you know there's Halloween 3 fanatics in the world. I'm one of them. I think it's one of John's best scores. I agree. That, that hey boom cue where he goes in the hospital and pulls the guy's nose and then goes out. That cue is one of my favorite cues in any movie score ever. John and Alan really got into the sequencer in that movie. The sequencer is a piece of equipment that can be used musically on a synthesizer. That yeah, 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 yeah. it totally works. That repeating thing and it really really drove the movie in a great way yeah everything you did on that movie i enjoyed your what you contributed to the carpenter films uh, i've enjoyed it fright night too i haven't seen all your tv stuff but i'm very glad that you've had success in that that's fantastic thank for you, you. Thank you thank and i appreciate you coming on my show tommy and spending all this time with me well it's been a pleasure uh, period thank you so much tommy likewise okay. take okay. care good night